All right, blessings to everyone. I am going to, in this video, first I want to give a shout out to the Symbolic World blog. Um, it is a blog that was put together by Jonathan Peugeot and JP Marceau, and it um, encompasses the symbolic vision and the symbolic world that is discussed uh, in Jonathan Peugeot's uh, YouTube page. Uh, and there's a lot of excellent writers that have already contributed to the blog. And I'm going to read from uh, Christian Roy, who just released this article entitled Marshall McLuhan and Eastern Christianity, Probing an Interfaith Interface with the Symbolic World in Mind. Um, there's been a little serendipity because I've been reading Marshall McLuhan and um, they just did a video on him and uh, his ideas with uh, juxtaposed with Rene Girard's. And I think there's a little synchronicity happening here. So I'm going to read this article here for you guys. And again, link to the Symbolic World uh, blog in the description. So before we get started, I'd like to recommend another book kind of in this line, in this vein. So this is uh, entitled The Medium and the Light. It is by uh, Marshall McLuhan and is edited by his son, Eric McLuhan um, and Jacek Sklarik. Great book. Uh, let's just go through some of the table of contents here to give you an idea what's in the book here. So the uh, part one is called Conversion. So now Marshall McLuhan converted to Catholicism um, in, uh, I believe, when he was in his 20s or his 30s. So the part one is entitled Conversion. Subsection one is G.K. Chesterton, a practical mystic. Another recommendation would be G.K. Chesterton, his books and his uh He's, he affected and uh, impacted and inspired so many people. I'm just really learning about. Um, so part one, conversion, G.K. Chesterton, a pra practical mystic. Two is the great difficulty about truth. Two letters to Elsie McLuhan. And three is spiritual acts, letter to Corny Lewis or Corinne Lewis. Part two is entitled the church's understanding of media. Subsection four is a communication media, makers of the modern world. Subsection 5 is key to the electronic revolution. First conversation with Pierre Babin. 6 is the de-romanticization of the American Catholic Church. 7 is, quote, our only hope is apocalypse. 8 is the logos reaching across barriers. 9 is international motley and religious costume. 10 is electric consciousness and the church. 11 is a peculiar war to fight. 12 is religion and youth. Second Conversation with Pierre Babin. Part three is entitled Vatican II, Liturgy and the Media. Subsection uh, 13 is Liturgy and the Microphone. 14 is Liturgy and Media. Do Americans go to church to be alone? 15 is Achieving Relevance. 16 is Liturgy and Media. Third Conversation with Pierre Babin. And then the last part, part four, is entitled Tomorrow's Church. Subsections are Catholic Humanism and Modern Letters. The Christian in the Electronic Age, uh, Wyndham Lewis, uh, Lemuel and Lilliput, then The God Making Machines of the Modern World, Confronting the Secular, Letters to Clement McNaspy, and then the last section is entitled Tomorrow's Church, Fourth Conversation with Pierre Babin, and there's a couple appendixes. So, great book, highly recommend it if you uh, like the books that I have been reading. All right, so here we go. I'm going to read through... Um, again, Christian Roy, I'm going to be linking to this article at the, um, in the description of this video here. Marshall McLuhan and Eastern Christianity probing an interfaith interface with the symbolic world in mind. Canadian literacy critic Marshall McLuhan became at once a media personality and a media guru in the 1960s with his groundbreaking reflection on different communication technologies, effects on human consciousness from the alphabet to the internet, which he is often said to have anticipated. But he soon became a victim of his success when his reputation subsided like just another 60s fad, somewhat akin to psychedelia and in involving an imaginative break with conventional thinking and a highly creative improv improvisational use of language. The enduring relevance of McLuhan's work became more widely acknowledged at the end of the last century, when a flurry of publications, including a special issue of Wired magazine, pointed to his prescience about the cultural effects of the digital stage of, of electronic media. 
Until that revival of interest in McLuhan's thought, relatively few people realize the importance of its religious underpinnings, and many still do not. And yet, its impetus has to do with his conversion to Catholicism in the 1930s under G.K. Chesterton's influence while he was doing graduate research in English literature at the University of Cambridge. He was then led to unpack the entire background of obscure Elizabethan polemics and had chosen as this topic, as a, as a thesis topic, all the way back to the early church fathers. Drawn down that rabbit hole, he came out the other end a changed man, remade by a deep assimilation of the Catholic Church's medieval scholastic and intellectual tradition. Quote, a Thomas for whom the century order resonates with the divine logos. I don't think the concepts have any relevance in religion. End quote. He could write to the editor of the United Church Observer. He, quote, analogy is not a concept. It is a resonance. It is inclusive. It is the cognitive process itself. That is the analogy of the divine logos, end quote. As his son Eric McLuhan further explains in Introducing the Medium and the Light, Reflections on Religion, the book that came as a revelation at, of the crucial depth, dimensions, depth dimension of McLuhan's thought in 1999. Quote, To a Catholic, faith is not simply an act of the mind. That is a matter of ideology or thought, concepts, or belief or trust. Though it is usually mistaken for these things. Faith is a model of perception, a sense like sight or hearing or touch, and as real and actual as these, but a spiritual rather than a bodily sense. The Protestants he found in his research had decided to regard faith in terms of ideas and concepts. Their decision meant that they had, in terms of the trivium, hitched their fortunes to dialectic and abandoned the old alliance of rhetoric and grammar to which the church still resolutely adhered. End quote. Marshall McLuhan would come to see that crucial shift in emphasis as a concrete effect of that from hearing to sight as the dominant sense with the advent of the printing press. The latter, as he would explain in the Gutenberg Galaxy, The Making of Typographic Man in 1962, was thus a direct cause of the breakdown of Christendom with the Reformation. His in investigation of media as, quote, an inventory of effects, invent, sorry, inventory of effects, end quote, to quote his subtitle of his 1967 book with Quentin Fiore, The Medium is the Message, a fortuitous pun on his famous message about the mass age was thus a Catholic humanist response, relying on rhetoric and grammar to the modern dominance of dialectical, purely logical modes of thought. For he linked the latter to the print-based, visual-biased conceptualism and moralism typified by Protestantism as the Roman Church's quote-unquote other, the rival account of Christianity that protested against her authority. But what of Catholicism's other, 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 an Eastern Christianity that remains alien to the Western matrix of modernity, yet close to Christendom's ancient roots. For the Orthodox Church was spread reconstruction, was spared reconstruction in visual terms when she denied the novel claims of the Roman see to direct universal jurisdiction over the other apostolic patriarchates. Constantinople, Jerusalem, Antioch, Alexandria, which which allowed it to remain more in tune with ancient Christianity. This may seem counterintuitive, given the centrality of icons to Orthodox worship. What is important is to understand here is that it is a matter of it is a matter of bias, of emphasis among sensory data that yet still come from all organs at once, just not in the same ratio between the two basic arrangements that played out with many um, variations in different anthropological settings, namely the acoustic, or rather, quote, audio tactile, end quote, a space of oral and non-alphabetic cultures, and the visual space of literate and especially print cultures. The shift from one world to the other is readily apparent even in the way that art produced in the Western church st started to visibly and functionally differ from that produced in other ancient churches after the Great Schism. For during the first millennium, similar symbolic patterns in canonical styles were consistently found across Christendom's entire reach 
from Ireland to India, mutually legible and readable, understandable across all local and temporal variations. Thus, Romance art is still canonically orthodox in a way that Gothic art soon ceases to be. The latter starts to favor psychological expressiveness in increasingly naturalistic settings, tending toward high-definition 3D rendering on different perspectival planes with in geometrically homogeneous space structured by historical or allegorical narratives. These traits of so-called quote-unquote primitive painters of the European tradition are soon systematized by Renaissance masters that define our idea of pictorial art as standalone, as a standalone window-like device opening onto a continuous world as an extension of the physical one, quote-unquote out there in virtual space. This stands in sharp contrast to the liturgical or communal context and use of earlier Christian art, little different in many other respects from its eastern counterparts from Persia to China. For here too, as with the pictorial art of these other these other scribual cultures from before mass alphabetic printing, we are struck by the symbolically potent hieratic frontiality of figures appearing out of a timelessly resonant encompassing background. They are like mysterious sounds arising out of nowhere amidst the thick fog without objective reference points to latch on to beyond their own manifestation to structure the surrounding space we sense through our whole body as well as our ears. The stance these images call for is one of listening to the unpredictably heterogeneous space they attune to uh, they t- they attune us to as opposed to the perspectival gaze pinpointed and par- uh, panoramic in turn that colors all of the Gutenberg man's perceptions even that of sound as in the development of metrilic highly analytic musical notation Being so aware of this turn to visual bias that defined the Christian West over against all other civilizations, what did McLuhan make of the challenge uh, of the challenge a non-Western Christianity represented to his intended defense of Christian qua Western civilization? McLuhan's references to Eastern Christianity in the medium and the light reveal an ambivalence that raises fruitful questions about the premises as a Western Christian. They also deserve to be pondered by Eastern Christians who may not share them all. For by and large, they have yet to formulate anything resembling McLuhan's sustained critical engagement with the ways different media shape man, especially in electronic conditions. This may seem paradoxical since their own traditional, their own tradition as exemplified by icon worship and its theology shows extraordinary sensitivity to those issues. It should come as no surprise that then that one possible ex- exception to this pattern has come from iconographer Jonathan Pajot in the way he has found himself spearheading a whole movement of probing, also in McLuhan's intuitive perceptual sense, cultural criticism. Arising from his churchly artistic practice and experience, it has taken an essentially oral, dialogical form in the neoacoustic environment of electronic and social media. This should not be surprising, since this new media retrieves certain features of preprint and even preliterate cultures, e.g. in that their information overload favors instant symbolic pattern recognition over sequential dialectical exposition. Even before he stumbled into unexpected prominence on the so-called intellectual dark web, Jonathan Peugeot had been pressing me for several, several years to write for the Orthodox Arts Journal. He co-founded an article, uh, an article along the lines of this one, which instead first took shape as a paper for the McLuhan Faith and Works Conference held at St. Paul's College, Winnipeg, on October 18th to 19th, 2015. In this updated version of the Symbolic World blog, I will be probing this largely uncharted ground of the interface between Eastern and Western modes of Christian thought and experience as applied to these shifts in the apprehension of the symbolic order of reality tied to different media regimes through the centuries. I will be approaching this inquiry from an angle in some ways comparable to McLuhan's own trajectory, namely as a Western convert to Orthodox Christianity for over three decades now, about as long as I have been 
fitfully grappling with McLuhan's insights. This next section is entitled Fateful Ruptures Before the Reformation, the Gregorian Reform as Great Schism. As a, resina- as a Renaissance scholar, Marshall McLuhan embraced Roman Catholicism just as he was coming to realize that the Protestant Reformation was the product of print. Quote, as the church was destroyed or dismembered in the era, in the era by a stupid historical blunder, by a technology, end quote. For, quote, this slide towards the visual also explains the appearance of sex. The word sect invokes visual fragmentation. Suddenly, with Gutenberg, classification took, en- took on enormous importance, including classification of religious attitudes and dogma, end quote. This was a result of the unmediated availability of standard texts now directly available to any individual out of local context within the vast delocalized audience created by print, allowing each reader to, quote, invest his own particular point of view. Things did not happen in this way in manuscript tradition because the operation was much more acoustic than visual and because transmission mostly came about orally, end quote. Silent individual reading was even physically impossible without mouthing the words. This ability only became widespread along with printed books and became central to the first Protestant who, quote, transposed the old method of scholastic discussion into a new visual order. They thus used the new discovery of print to dig the trench that separated them from the Roman church, end quote. Quote, medieval culture based on manuscript allowed for a style of communal life very different from the mass community which appeared with print, end quote, a style that persisted in the Eastern Church. But there it has long been understood to be, to be thanks to an early rejection, both instinctive and theological, of scholasticism seen as a dangerous temptation from a Western Church that was already stray, straying into a conceptual and therefore visual bias unconducive to an inner understanding of the faith as orally transmitted, e.g. through the liturgy. To be sure, a new wave of scholarship has been piercing, has been piercing, piercing evidence of a more nuanced and appreciative Eastern churches from, uh, sorry, from the Eastern reception of scholastic thought that was long stressed when Orthodox theologians were still trying to free their churches from a centuries-old Babylonian captivity to Western models and methods, to use this famous phrase by Georges Florovsky, initiator of the neoplatonic, neopatristic turn in modern Orthodox theology. Nevertheless, Greek theologian Christos Yanaras may have put his finger on an epistemological difference of the same kind McLuhan highlighted within the Western Church around this, the time of the Reformation only locating soon after the medieval parting of the ways between East and West. For according to him, the latter's increasing reliance on scholasticism soon after the Great Schism already, quote, ruled out cognition as the experience of communion and relation. It limited truth to individual comprehension to the correspondence of thought and the object of thought. As, as, uh, end quote, as critiqued by Heidegger on the essence of truth. Here's a quote from Heidegger. It founded an individualistic anthropology and a rationalist theory of knowledge that saw their completed systematization in scholasticism and later in Descartes. The theology of the West wanted to establish itself as a positive science, to prove the existence of God with rational arguments and to oppose its ethics as functionality. It thus transformed God into a dead concept. Philosopher Begriff Kant preparing the way for metaphysical nihilism, end quote. Thus, the transformation of faith from a percept to a concept was, from such an Eastern perspective, underway long before the advent of print as the very process that drove the Roman church out of communion with the other ancient patri- patriarchates in the same Orthodox faith. For her invention of a universal papacy came to hand with the 21st, the 11th century Gregorian reform 
at the same time as the emergence of scholasticism, the infatuation with Roman law, stressing, stressing such uncom uncommunal concepts as sovereignty and property, the satisfaction theory of atonement as the son's payment of man's infinite debt to assuage the father's wrath, purgatory with its individualized accounting of the soul's post mortem destiny, and other dubious religious innovations. All these related developments had in common that they tended to enshrine individual salvation and institutional standardization as hallmarks of a new visual bias. Beholden as he was to this medieval synthesis that set Roman Catholicism apart from previous and further ecclesial, ecclesial developments, McLuhan recognized that Quote, the Eastern Church, being iconic and audio tactile, could not tolerate the visual hierarchy of Rome with external materialistic aspects. End quote. Later bolstered by the Counter Reformation's emphasis on print based centralized bureaucracy. The latter fell to him as dead weight now that Catholicism was caught in the alternative to sink or swim in the neo tribal electric environment, quote, with its multi locational boundlessness. End quote. The sense of everything in the world happening, as it were, within earshot all at once in a quote-unquote global village that came into view with television and later became palp palpable through smartphones as new audio-tactile organs within the World Wide Web of permanent interconnectedness. Eric McLuhan's thought on this new media environment could affect Catholicism in that, quote, something more like the Eastern Church may be in the offering, end quote, with doctrinal authority but no central high command. This could be one way to interpret McLuhan's quip, quote, It would be a good time to be Russian Orthodox. They split off from Rome because it was too literate, end quote. Beside, quote, an emerging body of Catholic theological writing in the Western drift back to Eastern holism, holism end quote, it might be tempting to take as evidence of a trend towards such a recovery of an audio-tactile audio, audio experience of Christian life the Eastern theological current of, quote, Eucharistic ecclesiology, end quote, for its emphasis on the communal sacramental embodiment of the church at the local level of parish and diocese, diocese has recently come to gain a wide appeal, even beyond the confines of orthodoxy. Even more telling, perhaps, of a shift in religious sensibilities concomitant with the flipping back of visual into acoustic conditions, rare is now the Catholic or mainline Protestant church that does not display at least one Eastern-style icon as a self-evident touchstone of authentic ancient Christianity. Is that new appeal of Eastern Christian forms to be seen as the Trojan horse of an Oriental peril to Western civilization as it dissolves into a global electronic environment, as McLuhan sometimes seemed close to suggesting? Or is it, on the contrary, an indication that the Eastern Church, far from being aligned with the ethereal, quote, elect electric information environments, end quote, that add up to, quote, a reasonable facsimile of the mystical body, a blatant manifestation of the Antichrist, end quote, might instead offer the promise of a concrete antidote to it. She is, after all, more faithfully in many ways to the original, locally embodied acoustic church, of which the di a discarnate electric planetary consciousness is but a Luciferian parody. The Roman church, for her part, remains saddled with old and new baggage of her own shift away from the common acoustic paradigm of Christianity's first millennium. The inherited centralized universal jurisdiction, of her defining visual bias was initially bolstered in the mid-second millennium by the Council of Trent, 15, 1545 to 63, that came up with her own answers to the issues of Protestant Reformation purported to address. This counter-reformation thus opened the way for spectacular propagandistic appeal to the senses and sentiment, witness renaissance in Baroque church decoration. Regimented institutionalization, e.g. the proliferation of specialized active religious orders and the method method methodical institu institutionalization of schooling and the legalistic micromanagement of morality that came along with catechisms of formulaic tenets to define the faith. On the other hand, at the height of McLuhan's career, the Second Vatican Council seemed to enable an acoustic reversal of modern Catholicism's self-understanding in the direction of the contentless ecumenism 
of an emerging noosphere of electronic media and new technologies portrayed as the imminent realization of divine spirit through mankind's increasingly collective planetary consciousness by the visionary Jesuit evolutionary thinker Pierre Teixardin, who remains a kind of quote-unquote patron saint to transhumanists. Both temp both templates of Roman Catholicity, uh, Catholicity have in common a definition of it in terms of continuous extension in space. It incorporates whatever relates to the Roman sea, taken as the signifier of universal validity or outer jurisdictional reach. This Roman quantitative emphasis, emphasis on Catholicity meaning universality as spatial extent may be contra contrasted to orthodoxy whose very name entails a definition in intention qualitative con content or better yet in comprehension a specific set of such experiential contents as locally transmitted through time these two ecclesi ecclesiological models can be correlated to the two imperial models defined by Harold Innes an immediate forerunner of McLuhan in what is known as the Toronto School of Communication Theory. The militaristic empires concerned with the conquest of space and the religious empires privileging transmission over time. It is clear that the Roman, Cat the Roman Church decided around the turn of the last millennium to organize and image herself as a world-conquering administrative state, initially to compete on the same turf with the Roman Empire she had recreated in the West in 800 in defiance of the surviving Eastern half. By contrast, the Eastern Church's paramount concern has always been to remain in communion through time and beyond time with the ecumenical church as she existed for a thousand years before the Great Schism, even at the risk of dwindling into geopolitical insignificance. Quote, better the Turk than the Pope, End quote, was a cry heard in Constantinople in response to 11th hour attempts to reunite the divided church and stave off the fall of, Eastern Roman, of the Eastern Roman Empire. Ironically, it would later be taken up by Protestants in their own struggles against the Roman church. The Western bias towards space coincided with a new visual emphasis, whereas the Eastern bias toward time has remained a function of an acoustic emphasis. Quote, it was Innes, Innes' conviction that stable societies were able to achieve a balance between time and space, biased communications media. In his writings, Innes is forthright in his own bias that the oral tradition, quote, uh, end quote, based as, it, based as it is on taking time for personal transmission, quote, is inherently more flexible and humanistic than the written tradition, which he found rigid and impersonal in contrast. Harold Innes held up both classical Greece and Byzantium as unique examples of a balance between oral and written culture that pointed a way to the future. McLuhan's own stance was more complex as well as more ambivalent, and it went through significant shifts. All right, this next section is entitled Ex Orient Lux, or Peril from the East, Orthodoxy in Technological Society. Marshall McLuhan started out as a wistful advocate of the acoustic paradigm he still recognized in the late Middle Ages, rather critical of the visual ascendancy of the Gutenberg galaxy, as he called it in his eponym eponym eponymous book by the modern world born of the printing press. He is still often assumed to have welcomed the contemporary turn away from literacy to renowned acoustic conditions ushered in by electronic media, neoliberal drums even coming to be viewed as their sanguine booster. And yet he eventually turned to a defense of beleaguered Western literate civilization, aligning its ancient Greek emergence from the Phoenician alphabet with its modern European print version over against all things Eastern, pre-modern, or even, or even early medieval. That is why he sometimes lumped together orthodoxy and the Orient, as they both answered post-literate Western man's longing, quote, to be immersed in things and lose the individual self, end quote. He saw how increasingly out of place this private subject had become, being a, 
quote, byproduct of the alphabet and the visual world, world that flows from it. The Eastern Church, especially with the Slavs, traditionally tend, tends towards the inner trip. From that comes the importance of the young Westerners of Dostoevsky and similar authors, end quote. McLuhan knew that he was talking knew what he was talking about, since those same Russian novelists had drawn them him into Christian faith when he was young and still a rebel against the soulless mass individualism of print culture. Quote, for there is a true and eternal pattern for human life, which the progress mongers want uh, want not not of. Blessed are they that find a follow and find and follow the pattern which leads to the symbolic world. One might have expected McLuhan to rejoice at the prospects for reconnection with this symbolic world inherent in a revival of audio tactile primacy within the human sensorium. This is certainly the impression he usually gave at the height of his glory in the 1960s. Nevertheless, there was a note of concern in McLuhan's frequent musings in later life as to, quote, whether the church has any inherent and inseparable bond with the Greco-Roman tradition of civilization, end quote. Had she not brought salvation in the fullness of time precisely to the post-tribal, quote, private individual equal before a code of written laws, end quote, born of the phonetic alphabet of the ancient polis? Quote, Christianity definitely supports the idea of a private, independent metaphysical substance of the self, where technologies supply no cultural basis for this individual, then Christianity is in for trouble. Why you have a new tribal culture confronting an individualist religion, sorry, when you have a new tribal culture confronting an individualistic religion, there is trouble. End quote. According to McLuhan, it was far from, quote, accidental that Christianity began in the Greco-Roman culture. A sense of private substan uh, substantial identity, a self, is to this day utterly unknown to tribal societies, end quote. However, it is not in these terms nor on the premise they express out of Eastern Christian and Christian sensibility, Russian writers and art artists such as Dostoevsky, Solzhenitsyn, and and uh, Tarkovsky have mounted their spirited defense of the integrity of the human person, not only against collectivist, collectivistic oriental despotism of the communist type, but also against the mass individualism of the liberal, quote unquote, civilized West. I know of at least one bold orthodox attempt to show that the gospel message is not married to Greco-Roman culture and could just as well or even more appropriately, be couched in the language of Chinese humanism and Taoist wisdom. But it is true that the broader consensus of Eastern Orthodoxy, non chaldean Oriental Orthodoxy is a different matter, having developed somewhat independently of Greek culture, does tend to assume a providential link between Christianity and Hellenism that managed to break the acoustic spell of archaic tribalism. Still, this shift is understood in somewhat different terms than the typically Roman ones used by McLuhan. Orthodox theology would quibble with or balk at almost every time, every term of McLuhan's alignment of Christianity as such with, quote, the idea of a private, independent metaphysical substance of the self, end quote. For one thing, Greek theology has always been wary of the kind of substance ontology taken for granted in the West from Augustine onward, as applied to Godhead as an essence somehow distinguishable from the persons of the Trinity. The philoquy uh, is often portrayed as having simultaneously muddied the waters of divine triunity and favored in compensation a drift toward a neat conceptual abstraction and away from faith's apophatically apprehended existential antinomies. Heidegger's deconstruction of Western metaphysics as tied to ontotheology, the confusion of God with being, equally deleterious to both, and naturally leading to the nihilism of technique, of technique is taken by Christos Yanares as independent confirmation of the wrong turn taken by Western Christianity. Significantly, another great Christian thinker of technique, the high church and Ang Anglican philosopher George Grant, a Canadian convert from liberal Protestantism like McLuhan, also came to this view under the decisive impact of a British convert 
to orthodoxy, orthodoxy, namely through Philip Sherrard's account of the Greek East and the Latin West. Quote, for Grant, the distinction is important for the simple reason that the West attempted to too clearly define God and God's being, whereas the Orthodox tradition was more willing to dwell in the mystery and essence of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The fact that the Roman Catholic Church attempted to be too sure about the economy and operation of God by the inclusion of the Philoque Clause, the relationship between Father, Son, and Spirit, Spirit and Son and Spirit, worried Grant. It was this Western need to sharpen, clarify, and fully understand that blinded the West to that which could not be comprehended. It's clearly a function of its need to visually grasp with, within neat concepts. Grant thought that Aristotle was back of the Western Roman Catholic Protestant way, and Plato informed the more mystical and contemplative Orthodox way. It was, the uh, it was the meditative, orthodox way that Grant held high, and he thought that Western Christianity had lost its spiritual and mystical way. Grant was fusing Simone Weil, Sherard, and orthodoxy in the 1960s, and he knew where he stood and why. Grant therefore saw in the Philoque Clause the budding of the Western rationalist way that would blossom into the need of 16th and 17th century science for clear and distinct ideas and the Western technological drive in the 19th and 20th centuries to master through reason and will the earth, knowledge, and human relationships. Furthermore, in contrast to McLuhan, I think that was the end quote, yeah, end quote. Furthermore, in contrast to McLuhan's identification of a private self as of the essence of Christianity, most Orthodox theologians take for granted the distinction between person and individual made popular by Christian thinkers of various churches in the first half of the last century, opposing to the humanistic, natural individual defined by private se uh, separation of oneself from other selves, the Christian person in and as free communion with other beings. At bottom, they reject the Western definition of the personal self as rational substance. Going back to uh, uh, Bothius in De Duobanas Natris et Una Persona Christi Adversis et Huken et Nestorium Liber, uh, Nature, Rationalist Individual Substantia, an individual substance of a rational nature. End quote. Only accepting a relational subject, pattern on the three persons of God, Thus, for John Zizulias, Zizulas, Metropolitan of Pergamon, quote, the, ver the person viewed in the light of the Trinity is not an individual in the sense of an identity which is conceivable apart from its relations. For the names, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit indicate a mode of existence that is of relation, end quote, to cite the Cappadocian Father Amphilochios. Personhood as situated nexus of mutual, quote, relations of ontological constitutiveness, end quote, not unlike symbolism as a complementarity of particulars that points to their co-emergent interrelation as a larger whole is a function of resonance with acoustic spacing. As such, the person thus understood is a resonant focus of relations, rather like the classical actor's mask at the dramatically sonic origin of the word persona. It remains at odds with the notion of fixed substances standing apart in uniform visual space, only affecting each other in predictable outer sequence. In McLuhan's terms, quote, for the auditory man, no two times or two spaces could be alike. Each is unique. Everything has its own structure, for this is what brings the stress on existentialism, end quote, that McLuhan not rightly connects with Russian authors and the appeal of the East. Yet he assumes that much that such a relational, quote unquote, internalization implies that, quote, the human condition is focused on the group, the tribe, the family, end quote. Ultimately, he fears, quote, according to Zen Buddhism, you have to immerse yourself in things and efface the self. You have to disappear. The same characteristics apply to the Eastern Church as a whole, that quote McLuhan maintains. 
But this is not quite how the orthodox sense of the person is a kenotic, selfless self, to borrow the title of a 1997 book by Lawrence Freeman, a Benedictine monk who draws on the Desert Fathers for a way, a way of Christian meditation, in ecclesial communion plays out. Zeziolas could thus follow up his classic, quote, studies in personhood and the church, end quote, gathered under the title Being as Communion, 1997, with further studies of communion and otherness, 2006, to spell out how, quote, if Chalcedonian Christology were to be expressed philosophically, it would be absolutely necessary to work out an ontology whereby distance is not an inevitable corollary of otherness, and unity does not destroy, but, this is important, affirms and realizes otherness, end quote. In a person's oral encounter with another, both resonate together within shared space more than they sequentially communicate across visible distance. Here, the neighbor appears as the concrete instantiation of a universal, though not uniform, whole, more or less in tune with all the other parts, and indeed as a singular member of their cosmic choir. This is the acoustic experience of space and sets the tone of the typical visual environment of an Orthodox church with its rows of icons of saints of all times that all feel present together beyond time, their individual features arrayed in a single attentive stance of communion with the sacred space reverberating, reverberating through them. The cosmic ethos that is meant to flow from this liturgical experience of the divine mystery echoing in human persons has been eloquently formulated by Saint Maria of Paris, martyred on July 20th, 1945, in the Ravensbrück concentration camp for aiding, and perse for aiding persecuted Jews. Quote, The churching of life is the realization of the whole world as one great church adorned with icons, persons who should be venerated, honored, and loved, because these icons are true images of God, that we have the holiness of the living God within them, end quote. All right, and the last section is entitled, Ecclesial Being as Cosmic Choir Beyond Private Selves and Global Tribes. Marshall McLuhan appears to concur with the kind of audio, tactile, local, global, quote, Eucharistic ecclesiology, end quote, associated with the Zizulas when he stresses in a letter to Alan Maruyama, 1971, how, quote, characteristic of man's humanity is his freedom in community, which the Christian community provides in the corporate freedom in the mystical body of Christ, the church, end quote. Now that the electric age has subsumed individual freedom into a corporate one, quote, in all tribal contexts, the hope of man is that he can be changed sacramentally so that he will eventually come to the, an awareness of himself in his community and discover individual freedom in his community, end quote. This hope is consonant with the Eastern sense of the church as a body singing in unison, which translates its local setting as the monadic, unaccompanied, partially noted chant of traditional Eastern liturgies, with only cues from orally transmitted knowledge, such as symbols awaiting contemplation by the proper spirit they point to. This is why people raised in these ancient forms of Christian worship often feel dismay when they come to encounter virtuistic scripted poly polyphony, polyphony and even instruments in the church setting in the West, which both foregrounds individuality and standardizes it relying on technical aids. The clash between a non-technological acoustic experience and a visual individualized experience of what the church and even a Christian is extends to the very understanding of the nature of theology and small o orthodoxy. McLuhan once said that, quote, orthodoxy in the etym etymological sense of the word is to corner oneself into a single point of view, end quote. But in the Eastern view, which is really a form of hearing, the word orthodoxy does not translate just as right teaching, but interchangeably as right praise, that is to say, right singing in unison without the discordant voice of individual choice, that is, the meaning of heresy. 
Hence the ultimate theological authoritativeness of the snug texts transmitted in the liturgy as per the adage lex orandi, lex credendi, the law of prayers is the law of belief. End quote. McLuhan comes close to this kind of orthodox understanding of the nature of theology when he says it, quote, can become a work, perhaps as part of the Opus Dei, part of the prayer for contemplation of God, end quote, instead of a mere game as a, quote, theoretical or intellectual construct, end quote. Due to the visual bias of his own faith tradition, he may be one-sidedly stressing the extent to which the church is, quote, wrapped itself in a visual culture that placed static permanence over all other values, the hard shell, unquote, of Greco-Roman culture that brought in the alphabetic age of visual man, logical man, Plato and Aristotle, read in the key of, quote, Parmenides and the first logicians who wanted to logically connect all beings, end quote. This may actually be more of a belated Roman key, whereby, according to Christos Yanaris, a more Heraclitian, fluidy, fluidly agnostic, if acoustically resonant, quote, Greek concept of logos was supplanted by the Latin ratio, end quote, and its fixed constants. He insists on the unbroken continuity of Hellenic civilization as fulfilled by the Eastern Church in substituting divine love for natural necessity in the definition of Logos from Yanaris. Quote, the decisive meaning of Logos is relation, the reference and the reception of or the response to the reference, which constitutes the event of communion. The entire universe, the whole of reality, is for the Greeks a communion of logical relations. It is a harmonic ordering of referings and referential responses to referings. This logical element renders the universe into cosmos, a word meaning embellishment. The cosmos is embellishment of harmony and order. End quote. This harmonic resonant cosmos is the world McLuhan identifies as of the pre-Socratics, especially Heraclitus, terming the quote-unquote acoustic people. They lived in a world abounding with voids, gaps, and intervals. For them, things stirred, intersected, and reacted to, on each other, end quote. This pre-Socratic acoustic world was, if anything, retrieved in the Eastern Church by the conversion of really existing continuous Greek civilization in the Christian mystery, which recycled its philosophical ideas within the symbolic array of prayerful paradoxes that is patristic theology. By contrast, in the Latin West, struggling to emerge from the rubble of a classical civilization overrun by barbaric frontier conditions, it was the other way around. The faith itself came to be recast within the reassuringly solid framework of visually inflected Greco-Roman concepts, that is, scholastic theology. Shredding that quote-unquote hard shell might not be tantamount to losing Christian civilization to the neo-tribalism of a clan-ridden global village, as McLuhan feared. It might even be an opportunity to realize that neither Christianity nor Hellenism are necessarily dependent on visual dominance as enshrined until recently in print culture. McLuhan's concern about Christian prospects beyond the West as defined in both time, modernity, and space, the Atlantic world, may have been exaggerated on that count at least. For there are some indications that Greek Christianity can thrive in its wake by providing an authentic embodied alternative to electronic facsimiles of what Roman Catholics call the mystical body of the church. This may be especially true in cultures still close to their acoustic tribal roots. Witness the exponential missionary growth of orthodoxy in Africa after local Christians spontaneously started seeking out the ancient patriarchate um, of Alexandria to join its timeless liturgies with all the Greek accoutrements of the Eastern Roman Empire. A more challenging missionary field might be the global West of hyper-modernity as discarnate electronic environment, so far gone from its roots, both alphabetic and acoustic, that it is increasingly swept 
by an impulse to tear away residual stumps of historical and religious quote-unquote baggage as cultural irritants. There, McLuhan's brand of media-savvy Catholic humanism and the mystical theology of the Eastern Church may well gain from mutual engagement to make intelligible to post-Christian Christian cyber culture how, through the incarnation, the human race, quote, has been assumed into the life of the divine Logos, which is Christ, end quote, and in whom, quote, there is no distance or separation between the medium and the message, end quote. All right, uh, that's the end of the article. Thanks for listening. Again, this was authored by Christian Roy. Uh, if you've listened uh, through the whole um, of this article and you're not familiar, again, with the symbolic world, uh, please check out the link in the description of this video. Thank you.